All right. Hello, everybody. We are back with adaptive immunity. And I wanted to point something out really quickly. Um, I feel like there was a practice question with this, and I think I misread it. So with immunity, they consider, um, in this, I say they because this is a new book for me. I'm trying to make my way through because there's different terminology and whatnot. Innate immunity is our first line of defense. So those physical, mechanical, biochemical barriers. Second line of defense is inflammation. Third line of defense is adaptive or acquired. Um, there was a question along the lines there, and I think I said the wrong thing. So I apologize. Follow the notes. Read the book. I'm old and forgetful. Okay, I'm just joking. I sort of remember stuff. But your question should come right out of the book in the notes. All right, so adaptive immunity is going to be longer living, more specific, and it gives you kind of memory cells that can come back and fight infections at a future time. So this is mobilized after those other barriers have been used and it helps to protect against reinfection. You will have what is called an antigen, okay? And this is a substance that says to our body, this is an infectious agent and it will stimulate our immune system. Lymphocytes are the cells that we'll be talking about with adaptive immunity. Um, T cells are actually made in the bone marrow and they mature in the thymus, ergo T cells. B cells are derived from bone marrow and then they turn into multiple different types of T's and T and B cells. So humoral, um, humors mean the fluids of the, of the body, antibodies in the blood are humoral immunity. They bind to those antigens on bacteria, viruses, anything that comes into the body that's foreign. Cellular immunity are T cells. So antibodies are going to be derived primarily from those B cells that we spoke about. T cells provide more direct cellular immunity. B cells have processes that they will attach to cells to create their destruction and then create signals to help other cells come and destroy them. T cells are a little more direct acting. Active immunity develops after exposure to an antigen. So this is our body's own response to some sort of stimulus. This can include uh, like vaccines, okay? And it's long lived. Passive is preformed antibodies or T cells that are administered you know, the medical community is getting to using antibodies and giving them to people, which is pretty cool. Another good example is the um, antibodies that come from a mother to a child. So those are temporary. So preform, once again, read every single word. Preform antibodies are transferred to a donor, um, from a donor to a recipient. And we just spoke about it. So this would be passive. Make sure you read through every word of this. Okay. <clears throat> Antigen and immunogens. Um, I found this super confusing. I'm not going to lie. This is some terminology that I find confusing. So think mainly the difference between an antigen and an immunogen. Antigen can bind with antibodies and have receptors on T and B cells but it doesn't necessarily always trigger an immune response. Immunogens um, induce an immune response and they are antigens, but not all antigens are immunogens. For our purposes in this class, I think for the most part, we're gonna just call antigens and consider them something that will trigger an immune response. Haptins are interesting. Another little subgroup here are substances in the environment that have to combine with something in our body to create our response. For example, um, poison ivy. Okay, poison ivy can bind with proteins in our body and can trigger a response. Not everybody is allergic to poison ivy. As a little side note, my grandfather could pick it up, play with it, break it apart. So maybe it has something to do with those proteins in his body, maybe he didn't have ones that bound to the poison ivy. Okay, 
Clonal diversity is simply the diversity of the B and the T cells and how they divide and start to go through the body and form different types and sort of um, scour the body to see if it has any foreign antigens and to get familiar with our body's tissues. We had mentioned that earlier. It occurs primarily in lymphoid organs. So those are spleen, lymph nodes, thymus to give you, and bone marrow to give you an idea. Results in immunocompetent T and B cells that have, whoops, the ability to um, react with the antigens. Okay, they allow them to create these different forms that are able to react to infectious agents. B cells um, produce, proliferate, and differentiate in bone marrow, and they respond only to one specific antigen. They form a specific antibody that you will have forever. Okay? B cell receptors recognize the antigen, <clears throat> and then you also will delete autoreactive B cells. So think about that. Auto is self self-reacting B cells. So if we have B cells that respond to our own tissue, our body recognizes those, something has gone wrong and gets rid of them. T cell development. Okay, so T cells will mature in the thymus and then T cell receptors will recognize antigens. They will then leave the thymus. The thymus is a fatty gland that's behind your breastbone and that will travel to and reside in secondary lymphoid tissue, most likely lymph nodes throughout the body as ready to go immunocompetent cells. Okay, central tolerance is not a term I'm familiar with, <clears throat> but I wanna make sure I am complete. And I'm going to look it up. Okay, central tolerance is another terminology for the removal of self-reactive B and T cells. Okay, so just another word for what we had spoken about previously. Okay, antigen receptors. So there's different parts, which I believe is... Oh, these are the T and the B cells. So <clears throat> B cells that form antibodies always have this Y presentation. We're going to talk about different structures in a little bit. And then um, the T cells have more of a straight receptor presentation. Okay, so a second phase of this immune response and adaptation. You have antigen processing and presentation. And then you have all these crazy complex cellular interactions where you start to form antibodies and T cells start to get ready to provide a direct response to cells. They interact with those antigens. Okay. Um, it, it, APCs are antigen presenting cells, abnormal cells presented by the major histocompatibility complex. So everybody has a separate and distinct um, major histocompatibility complex that recognizes certain antigens and has responses to them and we can have similar mhc to other people so like if you're donating tissue of some sort such as bone marrow you have to have a similar mhc okay so um, those b cells will turn into active antibody producing cells also known as plasma cells and then T cells turn into different types of C T cells, which we will look at in just a little minute here. Okay, so we talked about glycoproteins on the surface of human cells. We um, previously, I drew you a little picture, I'm not sure if you remember or not. And so here's a cell, if I can draw a circle with the nucleus. Okay, and glyco car protein protein it's a sugary protein layer outside the cell this may look familiar it may not because i'm so bad with drawing and this glycoprotein layer <clears throat> is part of this major histocompatibility complex 
that allows all these cells to recognize each other. Oh, this is part of my body. This isn't. I can attack it if it's not kind of thing. Also refer referred to as human leuco leukocyte antigens. So there's two different classes. There's endogenous, which are intracellular antigens, which are inside our own body, and then exogenous, which are from outside. And once again, in another way, our body can recognize different tissues and cells and whether we should be destroying them or not. Okay, this is the different processing of endogenous versus exogenous antigens. Uh, you see endogenous is coming from inside of the cell, okay, from the cytoplasm that fluid that is inside of the cell and being excreted and then it's being taken care of by that class one <clears throat> MHC, excuse me, and then this antigen presentation from bacteria, which is exogenous, is being taken care of from your class two is what that picture is showing you. And here is the cell. Okay, this is tricky. Urushal, a toxin found in poison ivy, is an example of an antigen that does not produce an immune reaction. It is, I will tell you to take it a step further, that haptin that we spoke about. So knowing that, it needs to be in, brought into our body and attached to a protein in order to cause an allergic response Think that is very tricky i apologize for that but this is how it is in the book so not all, all antigens or immunogens haptin is an example of um, in, um substance that doesn't cause um in response unless it's combined with a substance in our body a protein in our body okay so confusing, I know, but that is the rationale behind it. Cell interactions in the immune response requires three complementary intracellular signaling um, events. So you have the antigen specific recognition through the T cells and the B cells receptors It'll start that communication between cells that, hey, there's something here that shouldn't be here, just as we spoke about previously. And then there's a specific group of cytokines that start the cell signaling process to tell our body, excuse me, that there is an antigen in our body. Very similar. Okay. So if we're looking at T cells, so we have this antigen presenting complex presenting to the T-cells. T-cell activation will follow binding to that antigen. So the T-cell goes up to the cell that is the antigen, says, hey, dude, you shouldn't be here. And then all these other T-cells can start to kick into play. So Th1 cells help to develop cell-mediated um, cell immunity. I am having such a hard time ugh, talking today. Also known as TC cells. TH2 cells help develop humoral immunity. They start to kick in those B cells. Okay, so the TH1 cells help immediate response to the antigen. TH2 cells kick in with the B cells. TH17 secrete lymphokine, which is one of those cytokines we've spoken about before that activate surrounding cells, in this case, macrophages. And then Treg cells, um, there's different types of these. Um, I learned CD4 cells um, help to limit that immune response so there's not an over response to the situation. Super antigens bind to the T cell receptors 
and that major histocompatibility class two molecules outside of their normal antigen specific binding sites. These will activate a large population of T lymphocytes because they are super and they have some super antigenic response in our body, regardless of the antigen specificity. Induce excessive production of cytokines in those cell signaling um, proteins that release from cells and send out signals to the rest of our immune system. Cause a systemic inflammatory reaction, fever, low blood pressure, because you're going to have fluid leading that cardiovascular circuit and going out into the tissues, which could eventually lead to shock. TC or T cytotoxic cells will respond with the antigens on virus infected or cancerous cells. Um, and these can destroy these cells. And here's a visual to show you what happens there. So what they mean by an um, immunocompetent cell um, is a cell that's ready to go into fight, and then the effector cell is when it's into action. And you can see the cytokines are released. It'll also trigger that um, MHC reaction. Um, to respond to that antigen. Hold on just a second. In this case, it's saying the super antigens respond with MHC class two because those are exogenous. So it would only be MHC class one if it was endogenous. Okay. And this would be, oh, an abnormal cell. Okay, so this will be a response to an abnormal cell, which is inside our own body. Got it. Okay, B cell clonal selection. So a B cell that's ready to go and canters an antigen for the first time, you know, we'll start to differentiate. That means to produce more B cells. This turns into a plasma cell. This is who will release those antibodies. And you can see that process here. And those antibodies, once again, are represented as Y-shaped cells. Hmm. Right, so I think that is self-explanatory. All the different types of antibodies, I'm gonna kind of go through. There's different chains and you know let's talk about the chains. Um, you can kind of review those on your own. I don't think if any, you will be asked much about the actual structure. I think it's more the function. So you can look at that. I'm not guaranteeing that. I don't make the exams. Just trying to help out by reviewing some of these notes. However, um, I don't think structural changes um, because it gets into biochemistry is really in our wheelhouse. Immunoglobin G is most abundant. You can see it's 80-85% most protective activity against infections. Goes across the placenta, which is pretty cool. IgA, I'm going to kind of blow through this because I think this is pretty much self-explanatory. Are found in bodily secretions, most predominantly in the blood. Um, IgA2, I'm sorry, is in bodily secretions. IgA are found in the blood. And you can see there's the description of the biochemical structure, which is two slides back. Um, largest of the immunoglobulins, IgM. Um, first antibody produced during the primary response to an antigen, first line response, since synthesized early in neonatal life. And little babies are starting to develop that immune system. D, concentrated in the blood, functions one type of B cell antigen receptor. E, also in the blood, helps against parasitic infections. Okay. That'll actually attract eosinophils. So E, immunoglobin E, eosinophils helps with parasitic infections. Also some environmental antigens. That FC portion of IgE binds to mast cells. Once again, that's a structural description. And there is a little breakdown of visually if that helps you a nice little parasite. Ugh, closes me up. Okay. Visuals help me. I don't know. It may be a good thing to review. 
So you can have a class switch. Antibodies can change to another. They can start off producing IgM and change to IgD. And you could see the other ones as well. And once again, if I'm not reading, it doesn't mean you're not gonna be tested on it or don't need to know it. I'm just going through it quickly. And I believe some of these things you can review on your own. All right. Molecular structure. So we have <clears throat> where the antigen attaches. So here's that Y-shaped antigen. The antigen attaches at this area. That is called an epitope. Okay. Peritope is the receptor on the antigen itself. This is a long chain. This is the short chain. So this comes in, stimulates that, and it creates the um, memory cells that remember to fight it off. And then once it's attached, it actually draws other cells to that site to destroy that antigen. That's kind of the whole thing. So the antigen binding fragment is that area that I showed you that the antigen sits into. Crystalline fragment is um, responsible for biological function. Could not find that in the notes as to the location of it. I think it's where um, they connect. And then the polypeptide chains, they're light and heavy chains, and there's two of each. So light, heavy chain, where the antigen attaches, and I think the crystalline structure is right in that location. <clears throat> Antigenic determinant is that epitope, that is the area of the antigen recognized by the antibody that it attaches. The paratrope is where it is accepted by the antibody. And it forms a key into a lock presentation. That's a common um, presentation that we see at a cellular level. It happens also with hormones, for example. Hormones have a key into a lock presentation where this hormone fits into this receptor. So that way, if you release a substance, it goes to the specific area that needs to be stimulated, such as thyroid stimulating hormone. It only affects those thyroid cells. That's important to know because, and to realize, because if it went out and stimulated everything everywhere, that would be bad. We've got to have specific hormones for specific functions. So, what antibodies can do is it can directly neutralize an antigen by connecting with it. It bunches it up. So you have a whole bunch of Ys with antigens connected to them. And then it draws other cells to that area via inflammation to eat up those antigens and also to bring other functional cells that we need to break them down, such as macrophages, to eat them up once they are destroyed. And T cells are part of that as well. Okay, so. And you could see right there, direct, it grabs up the virus and then neutralizes it by releasing toxins and putting them together. So we can also have T cells and inflammatory responses come in and then indirect will grab the bacteria and it can have a macrophage eat that up and destroy it. Okay, so mucosal immune system. Mucosal immune system includes the respiratory passages and the underlying tissues. So if we were to look at the surface underneath, say the throat area, you would have collections of lymphocytes in those tissues to provide an immediate, immediate response if we get substances that are infectious. We also have antibodies in our tears, our sweat, our saliva, they're present in mucus as well as breast milk. milk. IgA is a dominant immunoglobulin, um, small amounts in, in these mucosal systems, small amounts of G and M are present as well. Okay. There's a visual of that as well. Okay. Primary and secondary responses. Primary response is that initial exposure. There's a latent, uh, latent period or lag phase 
where we have those cells developing. And interestingly enough, it's just when you start to feel better, isn't it? After five to seven days, we mount that response. Um, and you have IgM, which is that first one to show up for a specific antigen is detected after five to seven days. And then G response uh, equal or slightly less follows that IgM response. Secondary response, um, larger, so this is the same antigen, you're exposed to it again, you have a more rapid, quicker response, larger amounts of the antibodies are produced um, because you have actually have memory cells that say, hey, I remember that and I can create a response to it. Once again, IgM may be transiently produced, but um, IgG is producing considerably greater numbers with this secondary response. Other cells, we talked about natu natural killer cells, um, how to complement those TC cell mechanisms. Lymphokine secreting T cells will amplify inflammation, send out signals saying to our immune system, send more response. T regulatory lymphocytes provide peripheral tolerance and suppress that immune response. So we have T cells that also help to buffer that immune response so it doesn't go too crazy. Pediatric immunity, they have sufficient IgM but deficient IgG and IgA. So why they get sick all the time, they get were sick all the time. Oh my goodness. Oh, until they got into about second grade. I remember crying one day. You guys are always sick. This is why they don't have enough, you know, antibodies. So maternal antibodies provide that initial protection to help them with that during the first few months of life. Immunologically immature when born, deficiencies in antibody and phagocytic activity and that complement activity for little kids. Aging and immune function. So we get a decrease in T cell activity. Supposedly the thymus decreases in size. They used to say it totally goes away, but I've heard differently in some of the recent research. Thymic hormone, may, uh, hormone production may drop as does the organ's ability to mediate T cell differentiation. That definitely is true. I notice as people get elder, they, their immune system decreases and then a decreased antibody response to antigens as well. I hope this helps a little bit. This is a tough chapter. Pretty soon we will move out of these cellular components and into more organ systems. You will love that. That will be helpful. If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, have a great day. Take care.